July the 16th, 1945, the first nuclear explosion takes place in secret at Almogordo, New Mexico. Local residents are told that an arms dump has exploded. It is in fact the nearest that military science has come to the ultimate weapon, a bomb that will kill over 50,000 civilians at a single blow. The 20th century has been the most violent in man's history. Much of that violence has been caused by bombing civilians in open cities. The existence of air power has made it possible to bypass armies and navies and attempt to win war by attacking undefended centers of population. This film is about those attempts. It is about an extreme branch of military science, the search by military scientists for the ultimate weapon that will bring war to an immediate end and at no cost to the attacker. To tell that story, we will show much film that either never has been seen by the public or that is long forgotten. Much of it is propaganda film, but then war makers deal in propaganda. Much of it shows extreme nationalist prejudice. Then from the First World War onwards, much of the history of the 20th century has been the history of the political or physical control of one nation by another. The date is 1910, only seven years after the Wright brothers' flight. The airplane had hardly got off the ground. Yet if you had been to the equally fledgling cinema at that time, you might well have seen that planes were already being thought about as instruments of war. As the armies of the old world gathered their forces, war from the air was still a dream of the military scientist. For these soldiers were still living in the world of conventional military technology, the world in which cavalry would provide the main offensive thrust in an attack. Yet as the armies of Europe gathered in the hot summer of 1914, they were certain of one thing, that the war would be a short one. The boys would be back in time for Christmas. But soon it became clear that the war would be anything but short. Soon the armies were facing each other in trenches spread over hundreds of miles. The First World War was a unique war. Each nation amassed armies of a size never before seen. But this was only possible because for the first time in history the factories could keep them supplied. For the first time in history, armies were not dependent on a finite arsenal. This was the first war between the European nations in which most of them had a strong industrial base. The techniques of 19th century mass production meant that war could be fought until there were no more men, and there were plenty of men in Europe. Science had transformed the whole face of war. The First World War was a stalemate. Since the time of Napoleon, generals had relied on the strategy of swift offensive attacks. But now to leave the trenches meant to get slaughtered, particularly by that devastating invention of a Scottish clergyman, the machine gun. 
And so this impasse of military technology meant that the war ground on through 1914, 1915, 1916. There was, it is true, the tank. That could have been a new offensive weapon. The tanks were under the command of infantry generals, and that meant that they had to go at the speed of the infantry. And so the war became not so much a war of clear objectives, but a vast continental tragedy in which thousands of men were forced into a nightmare of fear and disease and madness. A war which slaughtered a whole generation. This was the tragedy, a war in which there was no particular strategy, only national hatred. Yet out of the mud of Flanders, where thousands of men were lost in useless attack after useless attack, was to emerge a new offensive strategy. It involved an entirely fresh approach to the military possibilities of mechanization, and it owes almost all its worldwide influence to one man, a man who was obscure at the time and who still is, an Italian staff officer. Guilio Douay was one of those few rare men who tried to understand the basic principles of war and how new weapons might be applied to them. As an officer, he saw that the First World War was a hopeless stalemate in which it was less dangerous to defend than to advance. The only security lay in the trenches. But behind the trenches were the factories that kept them supplied, and the civilian population that supported the war. In this impasse, airplanes could supply a new offensive weapon. The planes could fly over the trenches and by raining bombs on the cities behind them destroy both the factories and the morale of the people who supported the war. It's a theory that's remarkably simple, yet this obscure Italian was to revolutionize war and to influence war-making policy right up to Vietnam in the present. It was also a theory that infuriated Douay's superiors, entrenched as they were in the traditions, and believing only in the foot soldier and his superior native ability. In December 1916, Douay was jailed for insubordination. Yet Douay's theory of bombing is more remarkable because it was ahead of the technology of its time. Both the bombs and the planes of World War I were crude. Indeed, the heroism of the pilots often attracted more attention than their actual military significance. Nevertheless, in June 1917, a German plane was to cross the English Channel and bomb London. It was a strategic event that was to have significance to military science way beyond the actual damage caused. This was the first airplane raid on London. As yet, the bombs were not big enough to do much damage, and the planes could only just reach London from the Dutch coast with a favorable wind. There may not have been much havoc, but a capital city whose navy had defended it successfully for 850 years was now open to attack. Before the First World War was over, Douay wrote this. Let us suppose that in a few minutes a city receives in its central part 20 tons of bombs. Gases that kill prevent approach to the zone which has been bombed. Fires develop and spread. What happens in one town can on the same day happen in 10 or 50 great centers. What government will be strong enough to maintain order? How can work be done in the factories? And even if an appearance of order remains, will not the sight of a single airplane be enough to produce serious panics? It will not be long before the population will demand a cessation of hostilities at any price. There were small bombing raids all over Europe in the First World War, but essentially it was a land war and a war between soldiers. These men were the lucky ones, the ones who are not cannon fodder to new scientific inventions, such as the high explosives invented by the Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel and the machine gun. For the First World War marks a watershed in man's relation with his own inventiveness. It was the first in which soldiers could be supplied faster than they were shot. It was the last before strategic air power was to bring war not only to the men who fought, but to their families as well. The First World War totally exhausted the European nations. To avoid this, Douay felt war in the future must be sudden and short. If these men ever got back their sight, it would not have been long before they had seen this film. Paris gets ready for the war of the future. In bomb and gas-proof cellars, first aid squads made up entirely of persons in civil life. Don masks and sally forth into the city streets. 
It's a serious dress rehearsal for dark days that all Europe believes are sure to come, when new and deadly gases may be unloosed from the skies on defenseless cities by enemy airplanes. Sentries are stationed on rooftops, where in wartime they would be the first to give the alarm on sighting the enemy. And now, in scenes from one of Metro Goldwyn Mayer's thrilling productions, Metrotone presents a graphic visualization of an air raid of the future. Terror in the night. Showers of strangling gas bombs rain down. Film fiction that may someday be a fact. This is a prediction of a classic Douay-type war. All the elements are there. Surprise, attack on civilians, and a whole air force against a single city. Only the part about poison gas is wrong. In fact, the major weapons of bombing were not to be gas, but high explosives, incendiaries, and nuclear power. But who could have predicted nuclear explosives before Chadwick had discovered the neutron in 1932? This film, made between the two world wars, has an H.G. Wells quality about it. But it only shows Douay wrong in his predictions about technology. For this, he should not be underestimated. It was largely on the inspiration of Douay's writings that General Billy Mitchell was to attempt to show the superiority of United States bombers to battleships. <laughs> Billy Mitchell, on the right, was a disciple of Douay's, in 1923, he claimed that a thousand-pound bomb could sink a battleship. The claim was treated skeptically by the Navy. Mitchell was concerned with the broader ideas of bombing factories and civilians, but the first stage was to prove the need for an independent air force. He was duly court-martialed for his efforts. The interwar years saw the U.S. vacillating over theories of peace. But the Japanese ambassador had been present at Mitchell's demonstration. The Japanese were all too eager to develop a theory of war that would put the whole of Asia in their hands. In 1931, the Japanese attempted the first bombing of civilians in an effort to bring the Chinese government to its knees. Hundreds of civilians were killed or burned in the old wooden cities of China. But the Chinese regime was so decadent and fell so easily that Western military observers found it hard to judge whether Douay's thesis was correct. Soon, in 1935, bombing was to receive a test nearer to home. Nightmare horror in Barcelona. The grim story of air raids. The most grim story yet, without being horrific. For these pictures tell of terror, not actually of carnage. Franco's airplanes have been over Barcelona and have dropped their bombs. Here and there through the city where the bombs have fallen, ruined homes pay stark tribute to the ruthlessness of modern war. Once again, civilians were slaughtered, but once again the results were inconclusive except in human terms. The Spanish War was a civil war, and neither side wanted to bomb the population at large. But what criticism there was of the effect of the bombing was not enough to deter Hitler from giving the bomber a central role as his great war machine prepared to sweep across Europe. This is a German propaganda film about the training of aircraft mechanics, for in Germany, crushed and surrounded by larger land armies in World War I, the airplane had a special significance. As soon as he came to power, Hitler gave the highest priority to the scientists working with the Air Force. Already in the 1920s, Germany had defied the dictates of the peace treaty by developing new planes and secret factories in Sweden, Denmark, and Russia. Now, while other countries were still building planes on wooden frames, the Germans were the first to build an all-metal long-range bomber armored against anti-aircraft fire and incorporating the latest technology of radio communication and bomb sites. In 1939, Germany has the nearest that there is to an ultimate war machine, 
huge bomber force capable of destroying whole cities. But as Hitler moves east, he does not use his heavy bomber force. Instead of blanket attacks against the civilian population, dive bombers are used against important military targets, such as railroad centers. Hitler's strategy is the Blitzkrieg, which is the very opposite of Douay's idea. Air power is used only against military targets, for the whole idea is not to alienate the civilian population and not to destroy factories, but to absorb both into the German Empire. So far, Hitler has not found an intractable enemy. Then he reaches Warsaw. Faced with the resistance of Warsaw, Hitler has turned to a Douay-like strategy. So total will be the eventual destruction of Warsaw that the Germans will be able to make a landing strip of the central part of the city. This is Pinamunda. This is Hitler's gathering place of scientists and military men. This is the source of the technical innovation that has given Hitler almost total control of the air in Europe. Pinamunda was the source of new aerodynamic techniques, the jet engine, and eventually the ballistic missiles, which caused such panic in England in the later years of the war. But Hitler failed to finance Pinamunda seriously, as he also failed to finance German nuclear research. And he failed to finance them because he thought he would not need them. La Madeleine. Der Führer trifft zu früher Morgenstunde überraschend in Paris ein und besichtigt bei seiner Fahrt durch die Stadt auch dieses Bau. This is Paris, May the 12th, 1940. This is Hitler's greatest triumph. Unlike the science fiction film of the 1930s, Paris is not destroyed. The civilian population has not been terrorized with poison gas. Indeed, there is not a bombed building in sight. Hitler is not needed to use Douay's strategy against Paris because the Blitzkrieg has forced the British army off the continent and France has capitulated. This is the strategy of conquest at its most successful, for nothing is destroyed. This is the only time that Hitler ever visited Paris. And Paris is the only capital city that he conquered without destroying. One day in the life of an emperor. And one day that marks the end of a series of European conquests that stretch back to the high days of the Roman Empire. But air power has changed this. Never again will a city be won without being severely damaged by bombing. Ein Blick auf den Eiffelturm. Links vom Führer Professor Speer. Czechoslovakia, Poland, Austria, Scandinavia, the Low Countries, France. Now only Britain remains. Britain can only wait and gather in the harvest. Britain has no allies, and Hitler thinks that Britain will capitulate. But Chamberlain, who had attempted to intercede for peace with Mussolini, is out of power. London proves as intractable as Warsaw. London is bombed continuously for three months. But instead of destroying civilian morale, as Douay had predicted, it does the very opposite. Churchill is said to have gone out into the park at night in the early months of the war, praying for a German bomber to attack. He understood the effect it would have on civilian morale and on American involvement in the war. This soundtrack was made in 1940 when America was still a neutral. Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels said recently that the nightly air raids have had a terrific effect upon the morale of the people of London. The good doctor is absolutely right. Today the morale of the people is higher than ever before. They are fused together not by fear, but by a surging spirit of courage the like of which the world has never known. They know that thousands of them will die, but they would rather stand up and face death than kneel down and face the kind of existence the conqueror would impose upon them. Instead of destroying civilian morale, open city bombing seems to do the very opposite. But the British also have another weapon against bombing, radar. Before the war, Churchill had gathered together many of the most talented physicists in Britain and America. Between them, they had produced a defensive electronic mantle around Britain. 
Over 50 radar sites were connected to a control center, and this to the fighters. With German bombers flying at over 250 miles an hour, seconds counted. But radar enabled the fighters to get off the ground before they were bombed. Douay's theory had rested on surprise, but scientists had eliminated surprise. <laughs> Churchill won the Battle of Britain because a 10% interdiction rate meant the German bombers could be shot down slightly faster than they could be produced. It was radar that gave Churchill the advantage, and it was Churchill who understood better than anyone the cold statistical and scientific background to air war. He also understood that any sword is two-edged, the defensive tool can also make an offensive weapon. In May 1941, systematic work had started on a blind bombing system, Obo. This is the British offensive radar system for finding enemy bombing targets in a blackout. This is the beginning of a long, cold battle of scientific minds that is to make air war more and more devastating, and in which the only jokers are the spies. But it is not long before the German defensive radar system is as effective as the British. There is another twist to the story. This is German film of a captured British offensive radar system. Pieced together, its wavelengths can be worked out and jammed. The result is a maturing of air war, a technological stalemate, which leads to a radical change in Allied strategy. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Germany clinging more and more desperately to her widespread conquest and even seeking foolishly for more will make a most interesting initial experiment. By 1941, it was clear that the bomber was not yet the ultimate weapon. Douay had underestimated the effect of countermeasures. And so Air Force crews are instructed in a policy that disregards countermeasures. The Thousand Bomber Raids, introduced by the new Chief of Bomber Command, Air Marshal Harris. And now the message, comparable to Nelson's famous signal, goes out to all concerned. Press home your attack. If you individually succeed, you will have delivered the most devastating blow against the very vitals of the enemy. Let him have it right on the chin. <laughs> Pate Gazette welcomes back to Britain its special correspondent, Mr. Quentin Reynolds. And so it was. RAF bombers dropped big, beautiful bombs. Bang in the center of the night. Earlier, we heard Quentin Reynolds describe the morale-raising effect of bombing in Britain. Will German civilians really be so weak where the British have been so strong? A number cut right on the chin, creating havoc and fear in the hearts of the foolish people who put Hitler in power. This is Hamburg, after one of the area bombing raids. The important principle calculated by British scientists is to produce the right mixture of high explosive and incendiary bombs. When a large number of scattered fires start, the upward current of air creates a draft, and that starts a fireball. It is most important not to start too many fires, as the oxygen available to the fireball will then be used up. And yet the effect on German cities is similar to that on London. People do not turn on the government, and the same practical measures are calmly taken to evacuate people to the country. In Dresden, 60,000 people are killed in a single night. But peace has to be made with the living, not the dead. These people are not demanding the cessation of hostilities, the opposite, in fact. The bombing also fails seriously to affect German war production until the war on land is almost won. A special target is made by the Americans of ball-bearing factories at Schweinfurt, essential to all war vehicles. 
but the ball-bearing factories are decentralized. The American Strategic Bombing Survey showed clearly that German war production continues to increase right up to the end of 1944 in thousands of skillfully camouflaged factories. It is only in the last months of the war that these oil storage depots in southeastern Europe are attacked and oil production is brought almost to a halt. At this stage, the effect of bombing is considerable, but it is certainly not decisive. And so Hitler was able to produce a vast air force for his personally directed battle against Stalingrad in the summer of 1942. This is Stalingrad after the heaviest air attack that history has yet seen. This is total war. Hitler has crossed hundreds of miles of Russian territory and has built airfields within reach of the city. The Germans have almost total command of the air. The city is almost totally destroyed. What can be won in war? Hardly a building in Stalingrad escapes the bombing. And yet compare this film with the film of Hitler's entry into Paris. Instead of capitulating, the Russians have done the opposite. The more that is destroyed, the more people and industry disperse into the country. Thousands of small workshops are set up in rural districts and hundreds of thousands of Russians join the partisan fighters. Instead of bringing down the government, support solidifies. Before the war is over, 25 million Russians will be dead. Using guerrilla tactics, the partisans continually harass the German army outside Stalingrad. By February 1943, over 100,000 German prisoners have been taken, and another Russian army is able to break through from the Urals. The happy bomb has come. The troops defending Stalingrad have joined hands with the divisions which broke through from the Don. The last shot is fired. This Russian film has an English narration because it was made for the benefit of our allies. On the other side of Russia, those allies are fighting a very different war in the Pacific. the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese won the most significant air victory in history. American strategists are now faced with a situation that they have always feared, a war on both sides of the American continent, and one that promises to be painfully long. We are faced with a different situation to that in Europe. Pearl Harbor has meant that Japan has to be fought on a front thousands of miles long. The search for the ultimate weapon is still on, and more so than ever in the extraordinary circumstances of the Pacific War. On August the 6th, 1945, the atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Two B-29s were assigned to the job, one to drop the bomb, the other to observe. On the way home, the crews ate a packed lunch. This film was shot by one of them. The bomb had killed well over 50,000 people. But did it affect Japanese morale? It lowered morale, but the Japanese did not turn on their government. Indeed, most of them were dismayed at the surrender. Several major American authorities considered the atom bomb had only a small part to play in it, for the Japanese cabinet were already committed to peace. This film shows a great deal about what man's scientific ingenuity can do to himself, but very little about the consequences of that act. North Vietnam, 1968. 
We are in an underground printing press of the North Vietnamese Communist Party. The printing press is underground to protect it from attack by United States bombers. But this is a war in which propaganda is as important as bombs. We have jumped ahead in time. In 1944, Russian research on nuclear weapons dropped in favor of defensive weapons had resumed. Under the umbrella of nuclear stalemate, a small rural country can now challenge the most powerful air force in the history of the world. North Vietnam, 1968. A young guerrilla fighter diffuses an unexploded United States bomb in a sea of craters. In the first half of this film, we saw how, out of the ruins of the First World War, the ultimate weapon was developed. In the second half, we shall see how the powers holding nuclear weapons are sucked into an arms race against each other, and how they can be challenged by a quite different strategy. The strategy of people's war. If the image of the atom bomb was the most potent image of the strategy of the ultimate weapon, so the defiant image of the young communist guerrilla fighter is the most potent image of the strategy that has challenged it, derived very largely from the ideas of Mao Zedong. Just as Douay's theories were rooted in the First World War, so Mao's strategy has equally been rooted in history. These are Chinese refugees from the Japanese bombing of the 1930s. Their exodus to the country played a direct part in the emergence of Mao's strategy. While Douay's strategy depended on making the greatest use of technology in war, Mao emerged from a society that was very largely non-industrial. This is rural China in the 1930s. This is a dramatized film made recently that shows the strategy of people's war. These are peasants in the people's army. For here there is no high military technology, not even the distinction between civilian and soldier. Hoba. Chairman Mao teaches us, the film says, that when enemy is strong and we're weak, we must fully use our strong points and the enemy's weak points. If the enemy come in, they won't be able to use their cannons. In this way, they lose their superiority. Mao understood as well as anyone that the bombing of civilians can be the best way to create popular support rather than, as Douay thought, destroy it. And time is on your side because the enemy is, by definition, on foreign territory. Sooner or later, he is bound to be tempted to attack. They have their way of fighting, the film says, and we have ours. When they attack us, they can't even find us. When we attack them, we make sure to wipe them out. If we can't destroy them, at least they can't destroy us. This was the strategy used by the Chinese against the Japanese Empire. It was very different to that used by the United States in the Pacific. When the Japanese came to surrender on the USS Missouri, it was the United States that became the inheritor of their empire. But while the atom bomb had played a part in ending one war, it also signaled the beginning of another. America was the official conqueror of Japan, not Russia or China. For the atom bomb was, in a sense, the first shot in the Cold War. The Russians were present at that ceremony. And it was toward Russia, not China, that America now turned her attention. But Russia was also a huge industrial nation and a technological military power. It was against this background that post-war United States strategy was determined. 
During World War II, America's air potential came of age. It grew up in size, efficiency, striking power, and in technological development. That process of growth took time, but we must now realize that never again will we have time for such expansion. We must maintain an adequate, well-trained, fully equipped air force of the kind necessary to use these new weapons quickly and effectively. Today, science is providing us with more devastating explosives and with intercontinental bombers capable of carrying them direct to the enemy nations from existing American bases. And so America developed a strategy that came straight out of the Little Red Works of Douai. Today we think in terms of huge air armadas, utterly devastating an enemy's war-making capacity at the instant of aggression. 1948. We are in the age of American global air power. But while in the post-war years America relied on these huge bombers, Stalin advocated that a strategy that relied on machines rather than men was a symbol of bourgeois decadence. But in America, bring back the boys had been the slogan after World War II. With the upper hand in Douay's terms, what was the need for ground troops? This was the age of the super bomber and the age of technological breakthrough. First there was the jet, then the rocket-boosted jet. In 1946, the Air Force was even talking of a nuclear-powered airplane that could fly on forever. This was to be the American century, the age when American pilots talked of fighting a war after breakfast and returning home to their families for supper. You'd think sack men would get used to leaving their families, but they never do. Americans certainly are a home-loving lot. But the men are subservient to the machines. Air power is essentially a matter of technology. In the heady days after the Manhattan Project, technology has given pride of place in the American military scene. So heady is the confidence that the nuclear bomb can even be seen as beneficial. Strategic air power can shorten war material and save the lives of millions of freedom-loving men throughout the world. Douay, too, had hoped that air power would shorten war. But as Douay had been confounded by countermeasures, so American air strategy was to be equally confounded by the Russian A-bomb. North Korea, 1950. One year after the Russian A-bomb. The devastating machinery of American nuclear power is grounded. But Mao's strategy relies not on machinery, but on human adaptability and dedication. While America can only fight a heavy conventional war, the North Koreans are able to fight both a guerrilla war and a conventional war. The American Air Force claims that there is not a target left to bomb. But still the North Koreans are able to shoot down thousands of United States planes and fight on. United States strategy, so confident in the post-war years, seems to have come badly adrift. Large numbers of United States prisoners have been taken, and with everyone taken, the war became more unpopular in America. MacArthur had been sucked into a classic Maoist trap, in which he might not be defeated, but he certainly could not win. Against this background, he made his dramatic return to the U.S. in April 1951. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plane at West Point. When the Chinese had come into the war, MacArthur felt he had only one strategic means of winning the war, to use the A-bomb against China. The world stood on the brink of nuclear holocaust. They MacArthur came home and was relieved of his command. And like the old... What appears to be a drama is, in fact, a melodrama. I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. But the leaders of the Senate and the House do not applaud they still have to end the war that has been so unpopular and that has been such a blow to the nuclear confidence of the late 40s. In July 1953, an uneasy peace was signed in Korea, thousands of miles from American soil. The only hope seems to lie in a return to that soil and its values. A return to the assumption that Korea was the exception. A bad mistake for America. A return to the shelter of the nuclear umbrella. For America now has a potential thermonuclear weapon. 
But as soon as this return is made, a new threat appears. Let's face it. The threat of hydrogen bomb warfare is the greatest danger our nation has ever known. Enemy jet bombers carrying nuclear weapons can sweep over a variety of routes and drop bombs on any important target in the United States. As in the early years of the Cold War, America's attention is drawn away from the East and towards Russia. Moreover, Russia has an effective H-bomb before America. A mood of nuclear and anti-communist paranoia sweeps the country. Communist propaganda portrays the United States as being merely a paper tiger. It suggests to the small peoples whom they... In 1954, pray. Dulles forms the strategy of massive retaliation, the doctrine of nuclear terror. This implies not only using nuclear bombs, but threatening to use them against Russia if there is any communist aggression anywhere. Dulles is confident that by relying on its scientists, the United States can lead the arms race and force the Russians to divert money into arms and away from economic growth. In spite of Korea, we have come full circle to another refinement of Douay's strategy. The United States in particular has sea and air forces now equipped with new and powerful weapons of precision. Dulles's weapon of precision is the medium-range missile. By inheriting many of the German scientists from Pinamunda and by adding the new technologies of solid rocket fuels and computers together with smaller nuclear warheads, the United States is able to take a lead in the race for first strike capability. Yet the United States is continually surprised by Russia, for the Russians have inherited their share of German scientists too. It is the Russians who are the first to fire both a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile and take potential war one dimension further by putting a man into space. From the atom bomb on, American intelligence underestimates Russian technology, and so the mood of nuclear paranoia continues. Will this city be half rubble and half vapor tomorrow? Maybe, but not necessarily. Among the sophisticated guided missiles the United States Army has developed is one of the most accurate defense missiles of the world, the Nike. And so we go from the age of the ballistic missile to the age of the anti-ballistic missile. But who could control anti-ballistic missiles that would have to be let off within seconds on a radar sighting that might quite possibly be false? The answer was no one. The arms race was accelerating and turning into a nuclear nightmare. And so, when Kennedy came to power, there was a considerable change in U.S. policy. What Kennedy is watching are not nuclear missiles or big bombers, but a demonstration of a new form of anti-personnel napalm of the type to be used in Vietnam. With Kennedy and Johnson, the old strategists of the Dulles Massive Retaliation School left the Pentagon, and in came a new group of systems analysts. With them came the strategy of limited war and the idea of flexible forces, together with a vast array of more powerful and more precise bombs. Vietnam. How can we show Vietnam? How can we show a war which still arouses such passions and which is still continuing? One way is to show this film, a film report prepared for Air Force commanders on the results of several months' bombing. It has no music, no sound effects, only a dry narration that describes the different kinds of bombs dropped, napalm, high explosive, anti-personnel, and the targets against which they are used. It includes no failures. It is battle reporting at its coldest. This strike, 32 miles west-southwest of Saigon, BLU-27 in Sendagel destroyed four fortified enemy bunkers and one large cargo sampan. 28 February, a B-57 of the 2nd Squadron of the Royal Australian Air Force assigned to the U.S. 35th Tactical Fighter Wing attacks, helping to clear an enemy area for a new ground forces landing zone 25 miles south of Bintui. A blister camera on the Canberra bomber recorded the bomb impacts. The mission forward air controller reported at least five enemy-held structures and bunkers were heavily damaged. One March, F-100s hit a large enemy concentration near Tra Vinh, east of Bintui. Eight enemy-held structures destroyed, three damaged. Two bunkers destroyed, three damaged. There are no people in this film, for this is the airman's view of war. This is war from the air at its cleanest, coldest, and most technological. 
New developments in aerodynamics technique, infrared sensing devices, new laser technology, electronics that take us to the frontiers of modern physics, observational devices working with computers in real time, new types of napalm that stick to the skin, improved high explosive bombs, anti-personnel bombs whose fragments cannot be seen by medical x-rays. All these are thrown against the Vietnamese communists. In almost every aspect of the air war in Vietnam, we are on the frontiers of new knowledge. Even the pilots become almost mechanical, often being told no more about their targets than a numerical map reference. Yet often these targets are people. We have come a long way from the First World War when thousands upon thousands of men were lined up as cannon fodder for each other. But this is not a war for territory. This is a war for people's minds. But in this kind of war, what can air power achieve? Bombing can achieve destruction, that we know. Barcelona, Shanghai, Warsaw, London, Hamburg, Dresden, Hiroshima, Tokyo, Nagasaki, Seoul, and many of the cities in North Korea, all of these have been destroyed. All over the world, the graves of tens of thousands of civilians bear eloquent witness of this. But can bombing help to win war? Certainly it can help. Without air superiority, it is difficult to win a conventional military battle. Bombers are vital in wars for territory like the Middle East wars. But few wars today are of this nature. When fighting the communists in Malaya, the British did not even use bombers. For although bombing has depressed morale, never has it turned people against their government as Douay predicted. All the major academic surveys of bombing show this clearly. To see why, look at this film. It is North Vietnamese, but suppose that it was America that had been bombed. Nam Din Textile Mill, one of the largest textile mills in Southeast Asia, was completely destroyed, but the American bombing could not stop production. Factories are moved underground, and that is reminiscent of the German reaction to bombing in World War II. Women are armed, and that is reminiscent of the Russian partisans. Schools are moved underground, and that is reminiscent of the successful evacuation movement all over Europe in World War II. Except that here, they have to go underground, because it is the countryside that is being attacked, as well as the cities. Anti-aircraft procedures are taught to old men, and that again is reminiscent of the Russian partisans. We have a test today, we said. Don't be surprised. I'm going to fire a machine gun for the first time in my life, and after only eight days training. Underwater causeways are made for the movement of troops, a method of preventing bridges from being bombed that was developed by the North Koreans against the United States Air Force. In North Vietnam, lines of communication were major targets. The forest around roads was often totally defoliated by spraying from the air with toxic chemicals. But while scientific investigators maintain that much of the forest may never recover, dirt roads are simply mended by local farmers every time they are bombed. North Vietnam is a revolutionary state, but the bombing seems only to cement that revolution. in Vietnam is a war waged by the whole people. Every person who lives there fights. This is because all the people of Vietnam know how precious their independence and freedom are. And even while fighting, they try to increase production and to protect their daily life. This is a true picture of a people's war. In people's war, there is little distinction between civilian and soldier. In people's war, usually fought from a non-technological base, the object is to exploit the offense at its weakest point. Russian SAM missiles cost only $100,000. American bombers seldom cost less than six million, and often four times this. 
General Jap is, like Churchill at the beginning of World War II, a great defensive air strategist. The United States bomber is shot down. It is then salvaged as a trophy. In the first half of this film, we saw how people resisted the destructiveness of air power. Now we see this resistance become formalized as part of Maoist strategy. Relying on the dedication of people to the communist ideal, however much we may dislike that ideal, can make a mockery of a strategy that relies heavily on machines. The U.S. warplanes shot down in Vietnam are used by the Vietnamese. At the beginning of this film, we saw how, from the days when planes were not even made of metal, military scientists were imagining how they might be used in war. We saw these ideas develop into an ultimate weapon, the weapon that could turn a person into a shadow. That is how air power can be used in war. But peace has to be made with the living, not the dead. And these North Vietnamese people are living. By turning planes into pots and pans and eating off them, they are defying American air power. By turning a plane into a plate, they are turning an instrument of scientific destruction into a symbol of cultural vigor. Might we not make the same mockery of the attacker if we were attacked? This would be a nice place to end our story, by showing how man's ingenuity can counter his destructiveness. But the story of air power is more complex than that. We are in a cage. We are descending into the earth below the countryside in North Dakota. These two men are Minutemen missile commanders. 3,000 miles away, similarly dressed men are descending in similar elevators deep in the Russian countryside. These men are the men who would press the button on command from the president. Each is armed with instructions to shoot the other should he go berserk, for the utmost safety precautions have been taken. Once a nuclear rocket is launched, it cannot be recalled. We are in a cage, deep below the frozen winter soil of the North Dakota countryside. There the grain of next year's harvest is lying dormant. We are on our way to the controls of the ultimate weapon. We know that the weapons of air power can annihilate us. But what use are they to a hungry world? Do they serve the cause of peace? Or do they only serve the causes of fear and suspicion? Meanwhile, the Minutemen commanders must continue their long, boring shift. Commander, inhibit switch. To inhibit launch. Inhibit launch. Deputy, lodge a clear push button. Not required, no lights illuminated. N.A. Flight display selector, required flight only. Rock. 